Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing diabetes mellitus and uh, anti-diabetic drugs. Okay, right. So, we've now discussed type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. What I now want to discuss is uh, an example of a monogenic form of diabetes. Now, there are loads of different types of monogenic diabetes, and they are all really, really rare. Okay, so firstly, what does monogenic diabetes mean? What does monogenic mean? Monogenic means that it's a type of diabetes that is caused by a mutation in a single gene, a herited mutation in a single gene. Okay, contrast that to type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Okay, type 1 diabetes mellitus is not caused by a mutation in a single gene. Okay, it has a strong genetic component to it. Okay, your risk of getting type 1 diabetes is strongly related to your genes, but it is most likely a combination of a huge number of different genes that causes it. Okay. Type 2 diabetes mellitus, again, has a genetic component as to how likely you are to get it. Some people can be horrendously obese and still not get type 2 diabetes mellitus. Okay, so there is a genetic component. It's not purely caused by obesity. Okay, but monogenic diabetes is back to really simple genetics. It is a mutation in one gene that causes you to get diabetes if you inherit it. Okay, right. So, uh, we're going to look at an example of monogenic diabetes, which is called MODY2. Okay, so within the huge field of monogenic diabetes, there are loads of forms of monogenic diabetes that are called MODY, and a specific type of MODY that we're going to look at is MODY2. So, what does MODY stand for? MODY stands for Maturity Onset diabetes of the young. Okay, now, this refers back to the days when type 2 diabetes mellitus was called maturity onset diabetes, because no one uh, who was under 40 generally got type 2 diabetes mellitus. With the obesity epidemic that is facing the Western world now, uh, many people under 40 get type 2 diabetes, and hence it's no longer referred to as maturity onset diabetes. But uh, MODY was called maturity onset diabetes of the young because it was more similar to type 2 diabetes than type 1 diabetes, and therefore it was referred to as um, the maturity onset diabetes or type 2 diabetes that was seen in the young. Okay, right. So, we're specifically going to look at MODY2, which results from a, a single mutation in one of your genes for glucokinase. Now, to understand what this is going to do, uh, we need to know more about how beta cells respond to blood glucose concentration and how they release insulin into the bloodstream. Okay, so... Knowing this pathway is going to help us a lot later on when we come to discuss the sulfonylurea drugs, which are an um, anti-diabetic medication. Okay, so we're going to do it in quite a bit of detail. Okay, so what I'm going to show now is a uh, pancreatic beta cell. Okay, so here's our pancreatic beta cell. So we want to see how does it respond to blood glucose concentration and release insulin. Okay, so... Firstly, it has a transporter on its membrane that is very similar to the glucose transporter 4 that we saw earlier in skeletal muscle cells and adipocytes. Okay. This one, however, is permanently in the membrane of the pancreatic beta cells. It doesn't move from vesicles onto the membrane of the pancreatic beta cells. Okay. And this is known as GLUT2, the glucose transporter 2. Okay, so I'll colour in the glucose transporter 2 in orange here. Okay, now, glucose from the blood then is going to be moved into the cytoplasm of the cell by uh, GLUT2. Okay, so in comes the glucose. 
Okay, and now what's going to happen is this glucose that is coming into the cytoplasm of the pancreatic beta cell is going to be um, respired. It's going to go through the respiratory pathways, those huge great chemical pathways, and this is going to result in the production of ATP. So I'm going to summarize the entire of respiration as this arrow, okay, which results in the production of ATP. Okay, so I think I'll add some colour on to make this look not as dodgy as it is. Okay, so here is glucose, and it results in ATP through a huge number of steps that I have missed out there. Okay, right, so what then is ATP going to do? Well, it's going to cause special ion channels that are in the membrane of the pancreatic beta cell to close. Okay, so I'll draw one of these here. So there are special ion channels in the membrane of the pancreatic beta cell um, which are, um, well, which conduct potassium ions, okay, so they're potassium channels, and they're called ATP-dependent potassium channels, okay, and for short, ATP-dependent potassium channels are often abbreviated as KATP channels for short. Okay, so you put a K for potassium and then you subscript it ATP. Okay, so if you see someone um, referring to KATP, that refers to an ATP dependent potassium channel. And I'll colour in the ATP dependent potassium channel in green here. So the ATP dependent potassium channel is open until the point that ATP binds to it. Okay, so ATP binds to the ATP dependent potassium channel and causes it to close. Okay, now I just want to go into the structure of these ATP dependent potassium channels in a little bit more detail because it will help us out later on. Okay, so ATP dependent potassium channels have a really fantastically interesting structure. Okay, they are octamers. They are made up of eight separate proteins joined together. So I'm going to draw it in more detail here. So here is it zoomed up hugely. Okay, and we've zoomed in so much now that we're seeing the two uh, phospholipid um, layers of the phospholipid by there now. So the membrane's gone from being represented as a single line to being represented as two lines on this bigger picture. Okay, here is the uh, pore down the middle which will be conducting potassium ions. Okay, and basically the structure looks like this. Okay, you have an inner circle of four proteins. Okay like so, and then an outer circle of four proteins. So, in the middle, the middle portion of the ion channel is made up of four separate proteins joined together which surround the pore in the middle. So that red circle, that red annulus that we can see here, uh, that's uh, made up of four separate proteins. Okay, and those are the ones that actually line the pore and help the potassium ions to move through this pore. Okay, now those subunits are known as KIR 6.2 proteins. Okay, now this stands for, well, the K stands for potassium channel, IR stands for inwardly rectifying. Okay, now the subunits that make up ATP dependent potassium channels are all in a bigger family of potassium channels known as the inwardly rectifying potassium channels. So this is a massive great family of potassium channels. We are talking about a specific member of this great family of proteins, which is given the rather nice name KIR 6.2, which denotes which family it's in, family number 6 of the inwardly rectifying potassium channels, and it's member number 2. Okay, so all of these six subunits here in pancreatic beta cells are going to be KIR 6.2. And I should have underlined this in red rather than blue, never mind. Okay, now let me just outline for you the structure of these subunits then. Okay, so each one of these subunits, each one of these four subunits that lines the pore, it's a integral membrane protein, a single polypeptide, so it will have an amino terminus and a carboxy terminus, and this is its basic structure. The amino terminus is on the cytoplasmic side, so this side of the membrane is the extracellular fluid side, uh, this side of the membrane is the cytoplasmic side. Okay, so the amino terminus is on the cytoplasmic side, then you have a membrane spanning alpha helix which will take you onto the uh, external side, okay, then you have uh, a 
key loop, which will uh, be this little loop that tries to span the membrane but doesn't actually span the membrane. And the reason it's called a P loop is because it's the loop that ends up uh, lining the pore on the extracellular portion of the channel. Only on the extracellular portion because it doesn't actually go all the way down into the intracellular portion. Okay, and then you have a final membrane spanning alpha helix here and then the C-terminus ends on the intracellular aspect. So each one of the quarter, um, quarter of that inner loop here is one of these proteins. So you put four of these proteins together to form that inner loop. Okay, now the outer loop of proteins. Okay, so the outer loop of proteins are made up of what is known as sulfonylurea receptor proteins number one. Okay, so this um, single member of the outer ring that I've highlighted here, this is a sulfonylurea receptor 1, named because they are the receptors for the sulfonylurea drugs. The sulfonylurea receptor, sorry, the sulfonylurea drugs target this protein. Okay, so SUR1 stands for sulfonyl, okay, that's the S, and then urea, that's the U and then receptor 1, so sulfonylurea receptor 1. Okay, so you put four of these sulfonylurea receptor 1 proteins around the inner annulus of KIR 6.2 proteins, and that makes you the full octameric ATP-dependent potassium channel. So the entire thing is an ATP-dependent potassium channel. Now, let me show you the membrane-spanning topology of a sulfonylurea receptor 1 protein. Okay, so the sulfonylurea receptor 1 protein has a huge number of membrane-spanning alpha helices, 17 in fact. Okay, here is its amino terminus on the extracellular face. Then you have five membrane-spanning alpha helices, then a large loop separating it from uh, a cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices here, and then you have a special structure in here that I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, then another six membrane-spanning alpha helices, Okay, and then another special structure here. Okay, so these two structures here, these are going to be important. Okay, these are going to be nucleotide binding domains. Okay, and we've got the nucleotide binding domain number one here, and then the nucleotide binding domain number two here. So NBD is short for nucleotide, that's the N. Okay, I'll just bring this up a little bit. Uh, binding, that's the B, okay, and then domain, that's the D. Right, so what do these nucleotide binding domains actually bind? Well, they bind ATP, okay, a nucleotide. So, this is starting to come together then, okay, I said ATP was capable of closing these ATP-dependent potassium channels, okay, the sulfonylurea receptor 1 subunit is where the ATP binds, okay, so ATP molecules bind to the nucleotide binding domains of the sulfonylurea receptor 1 proteins of the KATP channels, and that then regulates the inner proteins, the KIR 6.2 subunit and they then are going to um, actually uh, close. Okay, so ATP then is going to close the ATP-dependent potassium channel. Okay, and I promise this additional information about the structure of these things is going to be helpful later on. As I say, the sulfonylurea drugs are going to bind to these receptors and cause the channel to close just like ATP would. Okay, right. So ATP causes this ATP-dependent potassium channel to close. Now, what is the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is that it's going to cause depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of the beta cell. Okay, now why? Why does that occur? Okay, well, this is back to basic electrophysiology. So remember, when uh, we are at resting electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, okay, which is usually around negative 65 millivolts, which means that the electrical potential intracellularly, i.e. in the cytoplasm, is 65 millivolts lower than the electrical potential extracellularly. So if you cross the membrane, your electrical potential goes down by 65 millivolts, basically. 
okay, when you are usually at that uh, electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, you are at equilibrium, which means that your electrical potential difference is not going to change. However, you have still got a lot of ions moving across your cell membrane. Okay, you have a normal extracellular sodium concentration of around 145 millimolar. Okay, you have an intracellular sodium concentration of around 12 millimolar. You have an extracellular calcium, sorry, not an extracellular calcium concentration, an extracellular potassium concentration of around 4 millimolar, and an intracellular potassium concentration of around 155 millimolar. Now, you have sodium channels in the membrane of the cell. You have potassium channels in the membrane of the cell. Okay, so let's put these on. Here is a sodium channel, okay, and here is a potassium channel. Okay, now, uh, sodium will want to move into the cell, down its concentration gradient and also down the electrical gradient. Remember, sodium is a positively charged ion. It will want to go where the electrical potential is lower, which is the intracellular compartment. So sodium is absolutely going to come in. Okay, potassium is a little bit more difficult to decide. The concentration gradient is massively favoring potassium to move out. However, the electrical gradient is telling potassium to stay in because potassium is also a positively charged ion and wants to be where the electrical potential is lower. However, the concentration gradient is stronger than the electrical gradient and you do get a movement of potassium out. Now, the movement of sodium in exactly matches the movement of potassium out at equilibrium, okay? And that's why you don't get any change to the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane because you haven't got a net movement of charge across the membrane. You'd only get a change in the electrical potential if you were moving overall a net amount of positive charge in or out of the cell. Okay, it's completely balanced now, so you're not going to change the electrical potentials intracellularly or the electrical potentials extracellularly. Okay, so it's completely balanced. The problem, of course, is that sodium is going to pour in and potassium is moving out, so eventually the ionic concentrations are going to change, but then, of course, you have the sodium-potassium pump, okay, which uses ATP to pump sodium back out of the cell, okay, and potassium back into the cell, okay, to reverse this net movement of potassium out and sodium in that you have even at electrical equilibrium, okay, so this is the sodium-potassium pump here. So that's normal equilibrium here, okay, so normally across the cell membranes of these pancreatic beta cells, you have sodium moving in and potassium moving out. Okay, now, if you suddenly close potassium channels, which were part of these leaky potassium channels that were just normally open, okay, if these are going to close, then the amount of potassium that is going to be moving out, okay, is going to be decreased. Okay, if you close those channels, you're going to decrease the flow of potassium ions out. You're not going to completely stop it because there'll be loads of other leaky potassium channels which aren't ATP dependent, but you're going to reduce it. That's going to disturb the equilibrium. It's going to mean that more sodium is going to be coming in now than potassium is going to be moving out, okay? Which now means that you're going to have a net movement of positive charge into the cell, okay? When you bring a net positive charge into the cell, it raises the electrical potential intracellularly, okay, which I will write as EI. This denotes the electrical potential, that's capital E, I for intracellularly. Okay, that's going to raise the electrical potential intracellularly because we're bringing positive charge in and we're removing positive charge from the extracellular fluid, so the electrical potential extracellularly is going to go down. Okay, wherever you stick positive charge, that raises the electrical potential. If we're moving it away from this area, that's going to reduce the electrical potential. Okay, so the electrical potential intracellularly goes up, the electrical potential extracellularly goes down. What is this going to do for the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane? Well, originally, remember, when you moved from extracellular to intracellular, you dropped down in electrical potential. You dropped down by negative 65 millivolts. 
okay. If we have now reduced the electrical potential extracellularly, so this line moves down, and we have increased the electrical potential intracellularly, the amount that you're going to drop down is going to be reduced, okay, and that's known as depolarization. We're going to make the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane um, less polarized, basically, less negative, okay, so depolarization. Okay, now, this depolarization across the um, cell membrane is going to activate voltage-gated ion channels, specifically voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so I'll put this here. So this, I'll colour in, in what colour have we not used much? Um, we'll use, ooh, the agony of choice, pink. Okay, so this colour here. This is our voltage-gated calcium channel. And we're not going to uh, discuss the structure of the voltage-gated calcium channel. You'll be relieved to know in anywhere near as much detail as we discuss the ATP-dependent potassium channel. Okay, so the depolarization resulting from the closure of these ATP-dependent potassium channels is now going to open the voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, now calcium concentration extracellularly... I'm sorry, this is a, a bit of a wonk. Okay, um, calcium concentration extracellularly is around 1.5 millimolar. Okay, calcium concentration intracellularly is around 100 nanomolar. Okay, whenever you open a voltage-gated calcium channel, you are going to get calcium moving in. Okay, you don't even need to consider what the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is. No physiological electrical potential difference is going to be strong enough to mess around with a 15,000-fold concentration gradient. Okay, you're always going to get calcium moving in net uh, movement. Okay, so you get calcium moving in when you open the voltage-gated calcium channel, and then the calcium causes the fusion of vesicles containing insulin, which I'll draw like so. That's the A chain, that's the B chain here. Okay, it causes the fusion of vesicles containing insulin, and also, just for um, wider knowledge, C-peptide. It's going to cause the fusion of these vesicles with the cell membrane, and you're going to be releasing insulin into the blood. Okay, right, so that's how you release insulin into the blood if you are a pancreatic beta cell in response to glucose. Okay, so pancreatic beta cells will be doing this all the time. They will always have a little bit of ATP, and they'll always be closing a few ATP-dependent ch um, potassium channels, and they therefore will always be releasing a little bit of insulin uh, chronically, and that's that tonic insulin in the fasting state. But this particularly comes into play in the fed state. In the fed state, glucose goes through the roof in the blood. Glucose piles into the pancreatic beta cell. It's converted into ATP by these incredibly long and complicated pathways. ATP then closes a huge number of ATP-dependent potassium channels. Loads of voltage-gated calcium channels open. Calcium comes into the cytoplasm of the cell and causes the fusion of these vesicles containing insulin, which are storing it, ready for release, with the cell membrane, and you release loads of insulin, and that uh, then goes and controls this uh, rise in glucose by getting skeletal muscle cells, liver cells, and adipocytes to start taking up the glucose from the blood to try and prevent uh, a massive postprandial spike. Okay, right. So what then happens in MODI 2, maturity onset diabetes of the young 2? Well, Basically, MODI2 is caused by mutations in glucokinase, loss of function mutations in glucokinase. Okay, now, remember, you will have two genes for glucokinase, which I represent like so, okay? One on each of the two homologous chromosomes. Now, I do not know which chromosome specifically glucokinase is on, okay? But it is one of the autosomes. It's not one of the sex chromosomes. So we, it's a normal gene on the autosomes. Its genetics is normal. Okay, so these two chromosomes are some number between 1 and 22 that I don't actually know. Okay, but it is an autosome, basically. Which means that you're going to have two genes for glucokinase. One here on your maternal chromosome and one here on your paternal chromosome. In MODI2, you have a loss of function mutation in one of them. Okay, not both of them. 
Okay, I think if you had a loss of function mutation in both of glucokinases, that would be embryonic lethal. It would result in a miscarriage. Okay, but if you have a mutation, a loss of function mutation in only one, that causes all your cells to have less glucokinase that is functional now, but they still have some because they still have one gene that is functional. Okay, so the beta cells now have a glucokinase deficiency, but not a awful deficiency, okay? And that's why it doesn't kill you, because glucokinase is used in many cells elsewhere in the body as well. Okay, now what does glucokinase do? What well, catalyzes the first step of the respiratory reaction. Okay, the first step of glycolysis is catalyzed by glucokinase. It converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, so a tiny little step in this arrow is catalyzed by glucokinase. Okay, and beta cells use glucokinase. There is another enzyme that can do what glucokinase does, known as hexokinase, which is used in uh, cells such as skeletal muscle cells. Okay, uh, but the beta cells use glucokinase. So, uh, if you have de glucokinase deficiency because of a loss of function mutation in one of the glucokinase genes, that will mean now that in response to a certain amount of glucose, the amount of ATP this beta cell will produce will be less, because this pathway will be less now because the glucokinase uh, uh, is functioning at a lower rate, and this unfortunately is one of the rate-limiting steps of this reaction. Okay, so when the rate of this first step in this entire process is reduced, that is going to actually result in a reduction in the rate of the entire process. So the ATP produced in response to any glucose concentration is going to be reduced. That means the depolarization you're going to produce by closing ATP-dependent potassium channels is going to be reduced, which means that the calcium influx that you're going to get is also going to be reduced, and therefore the amount of insulin that these beta cells re release in response to a certain amount of glucose is reduced. So the beta cells always release too little insulin in response to a certain glucose concentration. Now let's think through what that means for both the fasted state and uh, the fed state, as always. Okay, so let's start off with the fasted state. Uh, okay, so if we go back to the fasted state then. So the fasted state, remember, you need a little bit of insulin to counterbalance the glucagon. Okay, if the beta cells are now releasing too little insulin, okay, uh, for the euglycemic glucose level, okay, that's going to result in too little insulin, and now uh, you're going to counterbalance, well, the, the counterbalancing is now going to be reduced, okay, and glucagon signaling will now activate the hepatic cells more than it would have if the insulin was higher. Okay, so now the hepatocytes are going to have too much gluconeogenesis and too much glycogenolysis. They're going to be releasing too much glucose into the blood, too more than the peripheral tissue such as the brain can actually use, and therefore you get chronic tonic hyperglycemia, okay, in the fasted state. Okay, the definition of diabetes mellitus. In addition, you'll also have too much proteolysis in the skeletal muscle if you've got too low uh, tonic insulin levels, and also, of course, you're going to be getting too much lipolysis, which is going to result in uh, too high ketone levels in the blood. Okay, now uh, then let's think about what happens in the fed state, and it's the same story as uh, in type 1 and type 2 as well. Okay, if you have too little insulin released in response to a certain increase in glucose, then uh, the amount of glucose that's going to be removed from the blood by the liver, the skeletal muscle, and the adipocytes is now going to be reduced. That means that your postprandial glucose spikes are going to be taller and again broader, okay, because simply your beta cells, they are aware of the glucose concentration but they release too little insulin in response to it, basically. Okay, so all of your insulin signals are just too small, basically, because of this malfunction in the way that the beta cells respond to, uh, ins uh, to glucose concentrations within the blood. Okay, so that is specifically maturity onset diabetes of the young uh, 2. 
okay? There are other examples of maturity onset diabetes of the young, uh, which result from mutations in different proteins, okay? But MODI2 is quite a common form of MODI compared to some of the others. Okay, right. So the final thing that I'd like to talk about in this video is just to say a few words about gestational diabetes. Okay, so in gestational diabetes, what happens is that the hormones of pregnancy cause insulin resistance. Okay, now this is a perfectly physiological thing to happen. Okay, the problem is that the insulin resistance is uh, to a differing degree in different women. Okay, and in some women, the amount of insulin resistance that occurs gets to the point where it is considered pathological, okay, and then requires treatment. Okay, so, let me say that all again, but slower. So, uh, basically, the hormones of pregnancy are responsible, okay? They are going to cause insulin resistance. So just like the insulin resistance that we saw in um, type 2 diabetes mellitus, you're going to have the same amount of insulin, but the responsiveness of tissues is going to be reduced, okay? Which means that the insulin's ability to induce an effect is going to be reduced, okay? So hormones are going to cause insulin resistance. Now, just like in type 2 diabetes, this is going to have effects on both the fasting glucose level within the blood and also the fed state glucose level within the blood. So let's just revise uh, what those effects are. So, in the fasting state then, you've now got the same amount of insulin as is healthy, but now the response of the hepatocytes is going to be reduced to that insulin. Okay, so again, insulin signaling is going to be reduced and it's now not going to counterbalance glucagon signaling nearly as effectively, okay? So glucagon signaling is going to drive a lot of gluconeogenesis and a lot of glycogenolysis, and therefore the amount of glucose you're going to be tipping into the blood is going to be too high. That's going to cause hyperglycemia. You're also going to get a lot of proteolysis, okay, producing the amino acids that will be used in gluconeogenesis, and that again is because the insulin's effect on the um, skeletal muscle cells is reduced from what it should be, basically. And you're also going to get increased lipolysis because this insulin's signaling is going to be reduced there as well. Okay, and remember the insulin signaling is responsible for the inhibition of hormone sensitive lipase, which is responsible for breaking down triacylglycerols to release the free fatty acids. Okay, and those free fatty acids are then going to be turned into ketone bodies. So you're going to get ketone anemia uh, as well. Okay, so that's what it's going to do in the fasting state then. It's going to cause fasting hyperglycemia, okay? And uh, then again, it's also going to have effects in the fed state, okay? It's going to reduce the effects of insulin when you've just uh, taken a meal, and therefore the effects of insulin on the liver, the skeletal muscle, and the adipocytes is going to be reduced, and therefore, again, the postprandial glucose spikes are going to be both higher, okay, because as the glucose is coming in, you're not removing it as fast, so it's going to get to higher levels, and also broader spikes because uh, it takes you much longer to remove it all afterwards because these tissues are not as responsive to insulin. Okay, so fed state, it's going to cause um, higher and broader postprandial glucose spikes higher and broader. Okay, right. Uh, now, why is this um, happening in pregnancy? Well, it's to deliver more glucose to the baby, okay? Um, so it is a physiological thing. It is there to help the baby. The problem, as I said earlier, is that in some women, this can reach pathological levels, okay? So the amount of hyperglycemia that you get is now dangerous, okay? So how much hyperglycemia women get is different between different women, okay? Some women get very little hyperglycemia, some get it to a much bigger degree, and then that sort of hyperglycemia is potentially dangerous to her body, and therefore we do want to reduce it down a little bit, okay? Um, 
not so that it harms the baby. We don't want to raise it, uh, lower it to levels that will harm the baby, but we want to lower it to a more safe level, basically. Okay, so uh, the nice thing then about uh, gestational diabetes is that after delivery, it generally does resolve, okay, so it goes away after delivery because the hormones uh, that are causing it uh, go away. Okay, so delivery resolves the problem. Okay, right, so those are the different forms of diabetes that we're going to talk about in this video. Okay, in the next video what we will turn our attention on to is discussing the symptoms that hyperglycemia presents with, and that's going to be common to all these different forms of diabetes. Then what we will move on to is the acute complications that can occur because of diabetes mellitus. Okay, so we'll talk about diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, we'll talk about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, uh, we'll talk about hypoglycemia. Then we'll move on to the chronic complications, so macrovascular disease and microvascular disease, and then finally on to the anti-diabetic drugs.